resume recording that one. So if you do this one on the calculator, let's turn the plot off. And I think you can graph the numerical integral. I'm not sure. We're going to give it a shot. And the derivative is x plus e to the 0.01x power close parentheses. I'm going to see if it'll do it. I don't remember if it'll do it or not. And then it's with respect to X. And I'm going to try to graph it from 5 to 15 and see what we see. I don't know if it'll work or not. Uh, probably not on that window. We'll let it get done thinking. No, it won't let me stop it. Just going real slow. I'll look back and reset my window. And I'm actually watching it draw and it is wrong. I got to stop by exiting or trying to close it or turn off the calculator. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm looking at the window. Yeah, I'm not either. But it's it's probably just giving us a, I don't think it's going to graph it for us. So I think the only way I'm going to get it to do that is to actually put in this integral, which would be x squared divided by 2. plus e to the 0.01x divided by 0.01 and set the one to go from 0 for 2000 to 2020. So that will be to 20. So it's going to be the area That's under that curve from there to there. And if you do the numerical integral, which we can do, and I think that was what it was trying to graph then that would be the integral of the function x plus e ah. 
to the 0.01 x I don't think I need that parenthesis. Oh, yes, I do, too. It's not right. Well, I must have put the function in wrong. Oh, yes, I definitely did. I was looking at the wrong thing. So it's x plus e to the 0.01x. Now what? Yeah, I do too. Okay, one, two, three, one. And I do need one after the last one to close them all up. So there's one, two open and one, two closed. should automatically close that one. X plus, you mean here? No, before. Before the X, yeah. That means I'll have to have another one at the end. Yeah. yeah. That should work out there. Okay. Ah! Hateful thing. Nope. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, the first, the first one has to be closing off the function, and then the second one has to be closing off the, I don't know, somehow still it looks like, well, no, it's assuming that the whole function has to be in parentheses. But we really shouldn't have needed that one. And if we didn't need that one, we wouldn't need that one. Ah, there's the simplest way. Now really what we did in uh, this section, if you've understood what we've done in this section, what we're doing after this is a problem, it's just problems like this one. 
So let's take a look at 15.5 and then take some time after we finish up 15.5 uh, and let you ask questions that you're stuck on for homework, okay? So for 15.5, we're talking about the area between two curves. Now what we did before was the area between a curve and the x-axis between two numbers. This time we're going to be talking about two different functions. And the example we're going to do in example four is a, a, this is a way you apply it. The executive knows how the savings from a new manufacturing process decline over time <coughs> and how the costs of that process are going to increase. How can she compute the net saving that when the net savings will cease and what the total savings will be? And the total savings is going to be the area between the two functions. So a lot of uh, the most important applications of integrals require finding the area between two graphs like that. And the methods that we used before generalize into being able to, us being able to do it this way. We can just take an integral of one function minus the integral of another function and find the area between those two functions. And that's what this is showing. This is f of x and this is g of x and what we were just doing here the total area under f of x from a to b is all this blue. And the total area under g of x from a to b is the pink. And what we want is the area between them, so we want the difference between this area and this area. And that's why that's a subtraction problem, because that's a difference. You're subtracting one area from the other. And this is just a formal statement of how that works. So what we want to do is look at an, uh, an example problem. This one's kind of technical looking, but we won't get to the applications until you get an idea of how this works. It says find the area bounded by this function, f of x is x squared plus 1, which is this blue function, and g of x is equal to 2x plus 4, which is the red line, and it goes from negative 1 to 2. And all we're going to do is we're going to find some point values. It's not really necessary to spend a lot of time doing a detailed sketch, but sometimes it is helpful um, if you find out where they intersect in case they do. For example, in this case, we're looking at two functions that don't intersect. And that's just really all this is saying is that if you set those two functions equal to each other, what you're finding out is that they don't intersect. There's no real answers to it. So I like the graphing method better than having to do that. I don't like doing the algebra of setting this equal to this to find out where they intersect and then have to figure out that they don't. I've done all the algebra for nothing. I would rather graph it and see that they don't intersect because you've got a graphing calculator. So the way that I would do it is I would graph it on the calculator. Oops. So I'd go to my y equals. And my first function is 2x plus 4. And my second function is negative x squared plus 1 or 1 minus x squared, whichever way you want to look at it. And since we're looking in and around the origin, there's no reason to go out, you know, like to big huge numbers. We can just stick with a, a standard window, which is the zoom 6 window. And so there, without doing any algebra, I, say, I can see that, hey, those things don't ever cross, okay? So that tells me all I need to do then is just go back and do the numerical integral. Of 2x plus 4. Minus. 
negative x squared plus one or one minus x squared, whichever way you want to put it in. And I did need parentheses in front of that because I'm subtracting one function from the other. So you do need both sets of those parentheses. And then it's with respect to x, and you're going from negative one to two. So I've got one, two, three open, and one, two, three closed. And it says it's 15. Okay? The one on top goes first, the one on the bottom is the one that you that goes second. What do you mean on top? As far as when you graph it. When you graph it. Okay. Because when you look at it, you see the linear function is on top and the other one's on the bottom. So the ones on top. Right. And that's why I like to graph it rather than trying to figure things out algebraically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you look at the graph, you don't have to do that because you can tell from the graph what you're doing. And it'll be the same way when we do example two. Example two wants us to find the area between these two curves. Y is equal to x to the one-half power, in other words, square root of x and y is equal to x cubed. So just go to your menu for your y equals and put in x to the one half power. Or go ahead and convert it to a square root if you want to. And then put in y is equal to x cubed. And I'm going to stick with the, the standard window at first. So I'm just going to go ahead and hit graph. And what happens when you do that is you see that the area between the two of them is right in and around the origin. So you want to change your window. So there's nothing going on on the negative side of anything. And you don't really need to go up to 10. You can probably just go up to 2 at the most. and you get a little better picture there. So the area you're looking for goes from zero to one. And the reason that you know it's zero to one, I'll change this back to negative one for just a second. is you notice that this function doesn't even begin until zero because you can't take the square root of negative numbers. So it's logical it has to begin at zero. That's where they come together. And if you take zero and raise it to the third power, that's the same thing. Now the other question is, okay, where do they stop in closing area? Where do they go apart again? And that means you need to find the intersection point. Well, you can use your calculator for that, too, rather than have to solve any messy algebra equations. Just go to second count, choose number five, get fairly close to the one you want it to find, and it intersects at 1-1. One, one. You'll have to set this set the, x to the one half is equal to x to the third. Okay, so set them equal to mm -hmm. each other and then whatever. Okay. Yeah, and then you'll have to solve it algebraically. Okay. But really, pr practice with this, Trina, because it should work. Just hit second trace and go down to number five. And as long as you trace close to the one you want, then all you have to do is hit enter three times.
Oh, it doesn't like that one. Well, it depends on, it depends on where your fault is. Because like, what you have to do is you have to be on the left side of one and then on the right side on the other line. And then that's how you get it. And so most of the time, what you're looking for, you can just you can do it three times and it works. But that's what you got to pay attention to. So like when you get second trace, mm -hmm. five, and when it pulls it up, so you see now you want to back up the left a little bit when you get the middle one, stop right there and hit enter. And then you want to be sure you're on the, uh, above, you're above that point. Like, see now you need to scroll all the way to the right if you're trying to go up to the, uh, for the, for the, the intersection at one. You need to make sure that your trace on this line is all the way above it, or like what you're doing all the way below it. No, it's still the, fine. Then. Below the intersection, not just yeah. below you, not just below you. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. And actually, I think it, it specifically says leftbound, I think. So I think you actually did that backwards in order to find. I thought you were looking for the intersection of one. If you're looking for the intersection of zero, ooh. I'm not sure how to do that with this one because that function terminates at zero. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure out. You can't do it that way, and I'm not sure why it's not letting me. Well, just be sure you're on the negative side on the second function see if that makes it work when you, get, when you trace the second function. Just keep going left. Make sure it's in the negative. Now you can just hope that it'll work. No, it doesn't want to find that. I think the problem with this specific one, though, has more to do with the fact that that one function terminates at zero. Yeah, I think it does because if you go and look at your table, you can see that they do have zero, zero in common. Yeah, the bottom function is the red one, and the top function is the blue one. Yeah. So when we actually do the problem then, we're going to start out with x to the one-half power. And honestly, to me, it's easier to put this in if I just put in the square root of x. I hope by this point you all know that x to the one-half is the square root of x, because we've worked with that all semester long. And then the second one, the second function, is x to the third. And we won't need that parenthesis then. Um, and we want to go from zero, not negative zero, to one. Because just from looking at the graph, I know they come together at x equals zero, and then they cross each other again at x equals one. Okay. So doing it with your graph and calculator gets you straight to the answer. And that's not to say that you don't need to know how to do the integration part of it, but you don't necessarily need to know how to do this. This is what you were saying you could do, Trina. You can do that. But if you do that, then you've got x cubed minus x to the 1 half, and that factoring gets a little nasty. Uh, 84 need to get to the interval. Yeah, there you go. You can do, you can do it. 
separately or you can do it all at one time. Okay. So these two things we did just by looking at the graph on the calculator, and then that's the actual calculus, but it comes up with the same answer. That fraction is equivalent to the numerical one. Now the bad news is I, you cannot do this. So I'll tell you how we're going to get around this. I wish I could tell you that this would work, but it won't, I don't think. Yeah, and it's because it's doing a numerical iteration process, and it's not going to come back and tell you the answer is a fraction form. If you put that in, and my math lab tells you to put it in as a fraction, Go ahead and put the decimal in and just go ahead and hit ask my instructor and I will give you your point. Yeah, I will. I know. If it'll make a difference in your grade, I will definitely get it corrected right away. But these, these should work. Check your answer to make sure it's right. So this is the graphing way to do it, which is what I've just showed you. And the difference between two integrals can be used to find the area between the graphs of two functions, even if one of them is below the x-axis. And the reason it works is because there's no difference in this integral and this integral other than these two actually have had a constant added to them to move them up above the x-axis. So, for example, we can do this one just fine by knowing the intersection points as long as we know all the intersection points and we put it in the calculator right. So we're trying to do the integral where part of this pink area is below the x-axis and parts above. And then we're trying to get also the blue area where all of it is between these two. And we're trying to go from 0 to 4. And the way that you're going to do that is first you need to find that intersection point because you're going to have to break this interval up. That's going to be the only issue. Because notice here on this interval the red line is on top and the blue is on the bottom. But on the interval from that intersection point on, the red line's on the bottom and the blue's on top. So they change, they swap roles. So what we're going to do is we're going to find first that intersection point. So we've got x squared minus 2x and then we've got y equals just x. And I'm going to try to set the window something like theirs just to save time, but what you want to do is you want to be able to, well let's just try zoom 6 first so that you get the idea of how you would do this. So we see here there goes the one, there goes the other one, so we see that what we're needing to find on the interval from 0 to 4, really we only need to go from 0 to about 5 or from negative 1. So we're going to go from negative 1 to 5. And then I'm just going to do a zoom 0 and let it set the others because I don't really care what the rest of it does. So what I see is there's an intersection point. They, both of them intersect at 0, 0. Because x squared minus 2x equal to x is going to come out and tell you that that's going to be equal at 0. The other one is at 4. Now I think this will work if you go second trace and number 5. Yeah. Yeah. So as it said, zero, zero. It'll actually find that one. It's like it's like you said before, Dave. The other one didn't want to find zero because it actually stopped right. at could, zero. Right. right. And then the other one.
Ah. So the other intersection point is at 3 3. Okay? Okay. I think I can explain how we do this better if we look at the picture while I'm trying to show you. We want the total area all the way from zero to four. So here's the hitch. At x equals three, they swap places. Here, before we get to three, the pink function's on top, the blue function's on the bottom. So it's top minus bottom. So that's gonna be the integral of x minus x squared, okay? And it's gonna go from zero to three. But then after we pass three, x squared's on top and, y, and x is on the bottom. And that goes from three on to four. So you've got two separate intervals that you're gonna have to evaluate. Does it make sense why you have to do it that way? Okay. So what we'll do then is we'll do the integral of x minus x squared from zero, oops, with respect to x, gotta remember that part, from zero to three, and then we're gonna subtract the integral you're well, Actually, you're gonna add them, not subtract them, you're gonna add them. Because you wanna add the two separate areas together. And then on the second one, it's going to be x squared minus x.
and you're going to start at three, and you're going to go to four. So the total area is 4.3 or four and one third. And that's exactly what that says. So then if you actually do the integration, and you can, you know, you can go through doing it. It's not bad practice because you do have to do some integration when you don't have the numbers to plug in. You've got to actually come up with formula. The calculator's not going to come up with the formula for you. But it comes out to be 19 thirds, and there again, you can always check that 19 thirds is, in fact, for an Oops. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. Now, why not? Did I put something in wrong? Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I did, was I put it in wrong. So let's, let's get back and fix it. So it's, the first one should have been, I left out my negative 2x. Yeah, I see, I see. X squared, Y minus X. Yeah, that should work. Now, why didn't it? Start all over again. Ah. Okay, the first part is x minus x squared minus 2x, x, 0, 3. <coughs> plus x squared minus 2x minus x. Uh, I need parentheses. That's what it is. You do need parentheses on this one. It just hit me that that was what was wrong. And then x squared minus 2x minus x it really doesn't make any difference. One, one open, one closed. Yeah, I need one. I need one right there. 
because it's x squared minus 2x minus x if you're going to put it in that way. If you're going to put it in like they did. So that is the matching answer. I'm not sure you need that second and that second one though. I don't think you really do need that extra set of parentheses. I think you could leave that off and that one. Yeah, and you can still get the same thing. So be careful with your parentheses. Now, before I go on, because the applications are going to come up now, before I go on, you understand what you need to do when you're finding the area between two functions. You have to know which one's on top because it comes first, and which one's on the bottom because it's subtracted from the one on top. Okay? Will it always give you the bounds? It'll ha it has to give you the bounds. Even in an application problem, it'll have to give you boundaries. Okay. Like when we had 2005 to 2015, that's your boundaries. Okay. So it won't, it won't just give you two it, okay. Well, it might give you two functions where it says find the, find the area between the curves and they actually do intersect twice, which is what the first one was. Let me, let me go back. Okay, that weird one. This one. See, for that one, because that did, that one didn't have. Yeah, it didn't have boundaries. It said find the, the area bounded by the two curves themselves. So they actually closed off a piece of area without having, without you having to be told that it goes from here to here. If you're not given any boundaries, you're just looking for where the two curves intersect. Okay. And that's the x value. That's the x value. It's always the x value, not the y value. Okay, so this is the problem we talked about at the beginning. Companies considering a new manufacturing process in one of its plants, the new process provides substantial savings initially, with the savings declining with time in years according to this function, 100 minus t squared is the rate of change of the function. And S prime of T is in thousands of dollars a year. So at the same time, the cost of operating the new process increases with time, according to the rate of cost function, in thousands of dollars per year. C prime of T is equal to T squared plus 14 over 3T. How many years will the company realize savings? And then what will the total net savings be? The first thing that we're going to want to do is we're going to want to graph the two functions. So if you graph C prime of T and S prime of T and find out where they intersect, you can see where the total net savings is because it's going to start at zero. Time isn't negative. But the savings are going to end where those two functions cross where cost is equal to the net savings from the, the function, from the new process. Now, algebraically, you can solve t squared plus 14 over 3 minus 1 or is equal to 100 minus t squared, and then you'll have to do some subtraction and solve with a quadratic formula, or you can graph the functions. And the functions are See, this is going to be plus instead of minus. 14 over 3 needs to be in parentheses. Unless you've got the numeral 84 and then it'll make your fraction for you. And then S prime is 100 minus X squared. No. Because I'm just looking for where they're equal to each other to start with. Okay. 
Now what I do know is that I need to go up pretty high on this function because 100 minus x squared tells me that it's going to have a y-intercept of 100. So my window is going to have to go up pretty high. And it says that, you know, you, do, you know you're going to start at zero because time's not negative. And they, you could arbitrarily say that probably it's going to disappear at t years or 10 years. So I could arbitrarily just go from zero to 10. I'm going to go from negative one to 10 so that I can see a little bit to the left of where they cross. And then I know that I'm going to have to go up to as high as 100 because of what the y-intercept is on this. So I'm going to want to see a little bit below the x-axis, so I'm going to go to about negative 20 so I can see my intersection points. So there goes the cost, and there comes your savings. Okay? I need to know, because obviously it starts at time zero, but this is where cost equals savings. So this is where you start, your savings are dwindling down to nothing and your costs are still increasing. So how much savings? Well, that's going to be the area inside this little odd shaped region. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the intersection point, second calculate number five. And since we're only looking for one intersection point, that intersection point is at x equals 6, okay? So from t equals zero, when they start the process, until t is equal to six, the area that we're looking for is this area in here. And that area is your total savings. That's your total savings. And you're only saving money for the first six years. because at that point you've come to the place where they're equal to each other and after that your cost is higher than your savings. Now the net savings over those six years is calculated by taking the integral of savings is on top so you start with it And then cost is on the bottom. And you're going to subtract the two of them. And your integration is going to go from 0 to 6 
and this is going to be dt. Does that all make sense? Oh, good grief, we need flux lines. It's on site now. Is everybody together so far now? So all we need to do is some calculation. We want the integral of 100 minus t squared, and the only thing we need to pay careful attention to is that we're subtracting that whole second function, so we're going to have to put parentheses around it. And then we need parentheses around the fraction if you have an 83. And then we're going from 0 to 6. Oh, now you're at about parentheses again. Oh, uh, let's see. You should have worked. Oh, I left out the X, I see. Never mind. Operator error. Okay, so it's 372. Okay. So there's your total savings, and it's 372, but you've got to remember it's $372,000 over the six year period. Go back to your units, okay? Any questions? Okay, the second application um, we'll do in a minute, but I want you to keep in mind that sometimes your uh, intersection points, sometimes your solutions are not going to be integer values. Sometimes you're going to get decimals and fractions. So an example for the solutions were 6.7 and uh, negative 7.3. We threw out the negative 7.3. It might not be realistic to find a, pro find a new process for 6.7 years. So what you would do is if you came out to a decimal value for that, you're going to have to evaluate at 6 and then evaluate at 7 and see which one actually gives you the better answer. If you get a decimal answer and you're talking about time, you're going to have to decide whether is it, is it at the end of the sixth year is the better or is it the end of the seventh year. And that's just a matter of plugging in the six and the seven into the, into the uh, 
the antiderivative. Now this is, this is probably for the economics folks in here, this is probably the one that will mean the most to you. Do you, have you talked in your economics classes about consumer surplus and producer surplus when those things happen? Okay, well you can use calculus to find both of those. If you, if you go into a store and you're willing to pay $10 for something and then find out that the item only sells for $7, then you actually have a consumer surplus because you didn't spend as much as you were willing to spend. But on the other hand, if you go in expecting to pay $10 and it's 15, then that's the buyer's surplus, so to speak. So if you want to find the consumer surplus, it's the area between two curves where P is equal to the demand equation and P is equal to some value. And you can actually plug this into, the, into an integral from zero to whatever Q sub zero is and find the value of the integral to find your consumer surplus. And you can do the same thing with the producer's surplus just using S of Q instead of um, P of Q. So for example here, the consumer surplus is the area between whatever the y value is at this x value. And the producer surplus is going to be the area that's underneath that piece of zero value. And the best way to figure this out is to actually do a problem, so that's what we're going to do. Suppose we've got the price in dollars per ton for oat bran. This is example five. And the demand for Q is 344 minus 3e e raised to the Q over 2 power, which I would immediately call that 0.5Q because I don't want to have to deal with the fraction. And then the demand, that's the demand when you have Q tons. And the function S of Q is equal to E to the Q over 2 minus 1 is the price when the supply is Q, ton, Q tons. So find the consumer surplus and the producer surplus. That's our goal. What we have to do to begin is we have to find out where those two are equal to each other. Where is the equilibrium point? And you can do that algebraically or graphically. With a problem like this, I honestly think graphically might be not quite as clean and neat as just doing it algebraically. So what we've done is we just set the two equal to each other. You add the 3e e to the q over 2 to both sides. So this is plus 3e e to the, e to the 1 half q and add it to this side. You've got 4e e to the 1 half q and then add this one to both sides, so you've got 345. And then divide both sides by four and get 86.25. And this is the only place where it's actually easier to take the natural log. If you've got E raised to a power, what you do is you take the natural logarithm of both sides to solve the equation algebraically. Now, if you want to do it graphically, you can. And Q over 2 is 0.5Q. It's easier just to type in 0.5X. And that's minus 1. Sorry, I keep jumping to the wrong function. And then your other function is 344 minus 
3e to the point 5x. We know we don't need to go to negative values. We're going to see initially just go from negative 1 to 10. And if that's not enough for us to see where they intersect, we'll go further. I'm going to go zoom and let zoom fit find the graph for me. So there's what my graph looks like. What I need to know is where is this equilibrium point? So I go second, trace, number five, and I get 8.9145, which is exactly the same thing I get solving it algebraically. That's my equilibrium point. So the, what that means is that my equilibrium point is where supply and demand are both 8.9145 tons. So the price is going to be E to the 8.9145 over 2 minus 1, or $85.25. Well, let's see. 85.25. I'm not sure about the units without it in front of me. Well, since it comes out to be the same value for both, look at the intersection point, Trent. Um, I'm just going to have to double do that. So I'm okay. Yeah, well, okay, remember that it's where supply is equal to demand. So if you plug that number into one, it's going to be the same thing regardless of which equation you need. Yes. So now that we know that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that x value in here. didn't work. Oh, because that should have been the y value. Duh. Let me go back a slide. What I want you to see is what it looks like on the graph. So what I'm going to do is plug that number into the first function. And what it sh should do is show me a horizontal line through that equilibrium point. Okay? Now, before we do the math on this, let me explain to you why that's important. The consumer surplus is the area above that equilibrium point, and the producer surplus is the area below the equilibrium point. Okay? So this is your consumer surplus. That area there is your consumer surplus. This area is your producer's surplus, and that's your equilibrium price, okay? And 
And when we do the math, what we're going to see is the producer surplus, obviously from this picture, is a lot smaller than the consumer surplus. And that's because the demand curve is more elastic than the supply curve. And if you notice, the, uh, the demand curve at Q is equal to 8.9145. Look how steep it is. It's coming down fast. So consumers, uh, when the consumers have a greater surplus, they're, when they're sensitive to changes in price. So if we want to back up now and do the math, I think this is where we need to be. What we're going to do is we're first going to do the integral from 0 to 8.9145 of S minus the 85.25. That's the equilibrium price. Okay? So we're going to use this second equation to find the consumer surplus because that's the one that's on top. And if you're not sure, you can always go, go back to your graph and hit trace and see which equation you're on. So I want the area between 0 and 8.9145 between that curve and that horizontal line. And the horizontal line is 85.25. And I'm going to type it in, even though you really don't have to since I've got it in the calculator. I'll go ahead and type it in. So we get 1795.13. And then for the next part, we're going to find the buyer's or the producer's surplus, not the buyer's surplus, the producer's surplus. And when we do that, what we're going to do is we're finding the area where the 89.2, um, 86 point, I think that's a typo. Well, no, you've already probably taken the one. Ah, uh, yeah, I did. I did. I realize now. But it's it's between that constant minus the bottom curve. So again, we're going to go take the integral of the 85.25 minus the function e to the 0.5x minus 1. 1, 2, 3, 2. Okay, so that's right. 
and we're going to start at zero and again go to 89.145. Or eight point eight point nine. I keep wanting to put that decimal in the wrong place. And that comes out to be five hundred and ninety eight dollars and thirty eight cents. If it's dollars. And I think it is both of these were in dollars. Right, equilibrium point minus, and for a uh, consumer surplus, it's the, the function minus the equilibrium point. Okay? And folks, that is it for the new material. You have finished calculus. Now we're going to take a test. <laughs> I don't think anybody in here is going to need to worry about that. We'll see. <laughs> that was, that's the good part about this is when you finally get to this last chapter, it actually is easier to figure out what you're doing than it is in the beginning. Everybody always likes the end better than the beginning on this. Okay, do y'all want to take a break and let me just answer questions for you the rest of the time? Okay. So let's see, it's, let me stop this recording.